Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, virtual town hall meeting uh, between um, Edelman, the largest private public relations and marketing firm in the world, and the Dallas Regional Chamber. I'm Dale Petrosky, and it's my privilege to serve as the CEO of the Dallas Regional Chamber. Uh, I want to thank Edelman for the opportunity to bring this important survey information to our companies in Dallas to help them run their uh, businesses more effectively, especially during these very challenging times. I'll tell you a little bit about the, the trust barometer, and then I want to introduce my good friend, George Ortega. So Edelman, as I mentioned, is the largest uh, private public relations and marketing firm in the world. And for 20 years, they have produced the Edelman Trust Barometer to help major companies define trust and credibility. And as the COVID-19 pandemic spread, Edelman decided to conduct a 10 country study. That's the basis of their new information that they're announcing today. Lots of interesting findings, important for every leader to read and know. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce my great friend, George Ortega, who leads Edelman's Southwest region. Prior to joining Edelman, George worked for another large public relations and marketing uh, firm, Burson Marsteller. And he worked in New York, Chicago, Mexico City, and Miami. George has a lot of talents, and they include, he's great at communication strategy. He's very creative. Uh, he is very talented uh, and facilitator, and he's experienced and skilled in crisis communications. And I'm happy to say that uh, George and his wife, Tracy, and their three daughters live in the best place in America to live, work and do business, Dallas, Texas. So George, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dale. Really excited to be here today with all of you and thank you for joining us for this webinar. So as, as Dale explained, we are very thrilled to share with you today the Edelman Trust Barometer Special Report that confirms the role that business must play as a source of reliable and timely information during this global crisis. Today, we're gonna to dive into why people are doubting the veracity of available information. We're gonna talk about how businesses have stepped into the void with responsible actions. To support our clients communicate at this critical moment, we're helping them understand the COVID-19 pandemic and its public health implications. We're helping clients manage communications with employees and customers, and we're helping set strategies and policies for effective preparedness and response efforts. This morning, our CEO, Richard Edelman, shared the results of another global study on the critical role that brands are expected to play during the coronavirus pandemic. If you were ever in doubt that brands matter, this new data reveals the power and necessity of brand as well as their urgent need to act. So in today's Dallas Regional Chamber webinar, which Dale and his team have been gracious enough to host. Our global lead for employee experience at Edelman, Cindy Roach, who's based here in Dallas, will share the results from the Trust Special Report and also share with us some best practices that we are already seeing in the markets, in markets around the world. And by the way, copies of both of these are available at edelman.com. And following Cindy's presentation, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to post questions which Cindy will answer. And now over to my colleague, Cindy Roach. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dale and the Dallas Regional Chamber for the opportunity to share this really important information. Um, I always take great pleasure in presenting trust data before, because for me personally, you know, really good data always helps me make sense of the world around me, but never more so than right now. Um, I'm especially pleased to share these insights with the group that's on the call today because of the really critical role that you all play in creating thriving and creating um, uh, caring brands and communities. So let's jump in. I'm just going to share my screen with you now. There you go. Okay. 
So as uh, Dale was saying, every year for the last 20 years, Edelman has been tracking the rise and fall of brands across four institutions, business, media, government, and NGOs. And today I'm going to start, uh, I'm gonna share with you um, some data from the most recent annual survey because it's gonna provide context for our brand new COVID research. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, sharing very briefly our methodology. Um, since you'll be getting this presentation uh, in, a, in a PDF form, I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but it is important to know that there are two key demographics. So we have the general public, but we also have the informed public who are bigger consumers of media, they are uh, slightly more fluent and they have more education. And that's important uh, for one of the two insights I wanna share from this annual research. First, let's take a look at some of the longer term trends over the last few years in this 20 year uh, survey of trust. So most recently, there has been a trend in the battle for truth. Uh, we've seen a growing sense of unease around the quality of information, as you can imagine, from fake news and Russian meddling in social media, et cetera. Another uh, trend has been this interplay between business and government. So in recent years, these two institutions have grown further apart. Trust in government has languished ever since the last recession, while business is now perceived as the problem solver. So. The first of the two takeaways that I'd like you to keep in mind as we go forward, this is from the annual research again, is this growing sense of inequity with greater income inequality globally and in the US comes a growing sense of inequity. And in fact, it's a completely different experience between these two realities. In the informed public group, they trust nearly all of the four institutions. Even government is just one point away from being trusted. But for the mass population, look at that, the world looks very different. Government and media are both distrusted. Business and NGOs are in the middle of a kind of neutral zone. But as you can see, there are double digit gaps in trust for every institution. The second takeaway from the annual survey is about what constitutes trust. For years, we've been asking a very simple question. How do you, you know, what, what makes trust in an institution? What do you do, i.e. take action? Uh, what is right? Take action in the right way. So we dug deeper this year to ask about what actually constitutes trust. So, well, corporate reputation is really, I would call it a lagging indicator. Reputation is really how a company's prior actions have resulted in their current corporate reputation. Trust is a predictive indicator. Trust predicts the faith that people will have and how an institution will act in the future. So in our, in our research, we found that the, uh, constitu the constituents, what makes up trust for people are competency, which you see represented on this horizontal line. But there are three components of ethics. The ethics that drive trust, and that is purpose. Is the company purpose driven? Is it, does it have integrity? And is it dependable? So the first thing that you're gonna notice on this slide is the big empty white space in the top right quadrant not a single institution is both competent and ethical. Um, if you look at the horizontal line, you will see that um, business is competent, but it falls below the ethics line. And if you look at this, uh, you see that NGOs are above the line on uh, ethical nature, again, that purpose, the integrity, the dependability, but they are not perceived as competent. So in fact, we found in further research that ethical drivers are three times more important to company trust than confidence. But the good news is that many companies and CEOs are recognizing this 
they're taking action to realign their companies and their strategies around this. If you think about BlackRock, perhaps the most capitalist institution in the world with $3 trillion under management, they came out a year and a half ago saying they really only wanted to work with purpose-led clients, purpose meaning they worked in long-term strategy and not just quarter to quarter, uh, quote unquote, growth. Less than a few months ago, they came out saying that they wanted to focus on sustainability. And you'll remember that the Business Roundtable, this very influential group of companies worldwide, came out saying that they really wanted to redefine the purpose of a corporation. So those are two really important takeaways just to have at the back of your mind as we now dive into the COVID specific research that was done in two tranches. The first was done earlier in March and the other around brand, which you'll see at the end of this presentation was just completed last week and you are the very first group to see this. So the very first um, group of information, the piece of research that we did uh, two and a half weeks ago was really about communications. And what we found out unsurprisingly is that health and safety and financial impact are the top concerns. But what was also perhaps not surprising is that the majority of Americans, and this is all American data when you see the flag in the lower left, um, the majority of Americans believe that things are going to get much worse before they get better. Um, this is the numbers behind uh, the health and safety concerns being of uh, paramount to everyone. Uh, but what was surprising to us was how concerned people are for where to turn for reliable information during this crisis. There uh, is a big concern about fake news. There is um, a very challenging complexity to this as someone who runs very large global teams uh, who help with internal uh, crisis communications. We have seen challenges, for example, in the DFW area where you have municipalities sitting side by side. You know, my neighbor and I, but my neighbor across the street in Dallas and I could be reporting to the same work site for a local organ, a local company. We might report into the same office, but if she and I reside on opposite sides of the county line, she is there. There are different things that must be communicated to her rather than me. So this has been a huge challenge for both internal and external communication, reliable data around uh, COVID because COVID is breaking, COVID information is breaking at the speed of news, as you know. And in fact, uh, while traditional major news organizations are the most trusted in general by the greater population, what we found was when we asked people who were employed what was their most trusted source of information, they said it was their employer. So they said employers are most readily believable. And this leads into this insight of this critical role for business that was resounding in this research. Uh, given the lack of trust in government and media, there are massive expectations about the role business must play during this crisis. So this slide and the next are from our annual survey. Sorry to keep going back and forth, but it's important for you to know that in the annual survey uh, that came out in January at Davos at the World Economic Forum, there was important information that almost 100% of, of people believe that my employer, the CEO, must speak out on all of these types of issues. Now remember, this was really before the outbreak of COVID, but this gives you an indication of the expectation that people have for business to lead. Then we found there was also in that annual survey a very important imperative, that shift uh, that now the sole focus of business should not just be uh, satisfying the needs of shareholders. This is what that earlier slide was about, um, talking about the Business Roundtable and BlackRock starting to look at all stakeholders as important constituents in the aims of their business. So you see here, 
employees and customers are actually almost equal uh, of equal importance as stakeholders for business. So again, this was just backdrop for what we found next. When we did this COVID research, and this is this what this slide is about, this COVID research that was done uh, two and a half weeks ago by Edelman, the resounding reply was that people see their employer as better prepared than my country to lead. So these expectations of CEOs have grown exponentially. And you'll see how this is like a pressing need in the minds of people. Business must act to protect employees and uh, their local communities. We're already seeing these philanthropic moves. Microsoft donated a million dollars to the Puget Sound um, COVID response fund. Uh, luxury good conglomerate in Europe, Caring, that owns Gucci and Balenciaga. They are now uh, re -sh they're shifting the priorities of their factories to create uh, medical coveralls and protective gear. And we've also seen leaders really trying to express gratitude for their local communities. So uh, Sweet Green CEO Jonathan Newman, he announced his company would deliver free meals to hospitals in the cities where they serve. And Starbucks is giving free coffee to frontline healthcare employees. Uh, we also understand that Americans are looking for business to really drive testing. Uh, more, um, the evidence is here that Americans are really, this is like, for me, one of the primary pieces of evidence of how much Americans are looking for business to drive innovation that protect, uh, you know, public health. And there are some high profile leaders who are literally applying the leaders eat last approach and they're taking personal pay cuts to show that they are supporting the exigencies of the business impacts right now. Marriott CEO pledged that he and his chairman would forego salaries. Similarly, the United Airlines CEO, Oscar Munoz, they said that they would forsake their salaries for um, the next few months. So while layoffs are inevitability, we are seeing companies trying to show flexibility and how they are really prioritizing employee stability. Uh, they're considering, when they're having to consider reductions in force, we see some organizations, they're offering furloughs before layoffs. They're establishing preferred rehire programs so that when the time comes as soon as it comes, they can reopen and resume full operations with that same valued talent. And another trend is uh, companies creating alumni groups to keep good talent really close to them and attach the organization until possible rehire. And as you know, in today's news here in Dallas, paid sick leave is a topic that has long been debated in the US. And it certainly is at the epicenter of this COVID-19 discussion. This is in the news today for us here locally in Dallas because municipalities were trying to enforce paid sick leave, but that was overridden by a higher jurisdiction. So um, we do see that uh, employers are also trying to adapt HR policies. Some leaders have aligned their organizational purpose to doing the right thing and supporting contingent workers during this crisis. Microsoft announced it would pay its 4,500 hourly service providers regardless of their hours worked. And their CEO, Mr. Nadala, with whom I've had the pleasure of working, shared the news to his LinkedIn and Twitter that they would be um, really looking for even more ways to support contingent workers. And here, of course, closer to home, in Dallas, you're familiar with Mark Kupan has taken a particularly generous stance towards his workforce. Regarding communications on COVID, employees are hungry for daily, if not more frequent communications. And here's where I really wanna stop and commend the Dallas Regional Chamber for their daily Regional Chamber COVID resources being like a, a one-stop shop for news and their top stories. Um, we are really, uh, you know, uh, 
grateful that they are providing this kind of information to their members. Um, as one trend line, one of the bright spots we've seen during this crisis is CEOs communicating and leading with empathy. We're finding this is hugely resonating with our clients. Even some of our most reserved um, financial institution clients are very responsive to this idea of the CEO as chief empathy officer. And we started to do more research around this. We've been working with one leading neuroscientist at Stanford University who said in his research that he wrote a book recently called Building Empathy in a Fractured World uh, and Leading with Empathy. And he says that in leading with empathy in a fractured world, decades of research have found that people turn up their understanding of each other when they have a powerful reason to do so. And that is when they are craving social connection. That empathy is a sort of mental superpower that overcomes the distance between ourselves and others. So he purports that during this crisis, that there is actually an opportunity for leaders to get closer to their people, despite the distance of virtual work, if they lead with empathy. And that empathy can be a filter for making tough decisions, and that there is a definite relationship between empathy and trust. So we should actually be asking ourselves and our leaders, is there a, you know, a burning platform uh, or a business imperative actually to lead with trust at this time? Because as the virus intensifies, we think that business and CEOs are going to be under even more scrutiny. Very important point in this initial piece of COVID research was the need for uh, private and public sector to cooperate with NGOs and the media even. <clears throat> so in the last week, we've seen flashes of this cross-institutional partnership. Um, I don't think we've seen it really, this level of cooperation since World War II. We saw glimpses, I'd say, in the promise of um, businesses like Quest Diagnostics and Roche and CVS to scaling up their ability to test and, and, and test their drugs and, and help with um, COVID testing. There have been reports of GM and Ford and Tesla retooling their manufacturing um, lines to create ventilators in shuttered plants and hotel chains turning into recovery wards. So this is the kind of cross um, sector and, and cross institution um, partnership that really seems to be necessary at this time. So for this last piece of research, and this is really where we de dig very deeply into brand, we wanted to, um, Edelman just in last week did this flash <clears throat> research on what it means for brands to do the right thing during the pandemic. So, and as context, you'll see the world already had high expectations of brands, uh, as you can see from this trend line from 2019 and 2020. Uh, again, here's the methodology, which you can take a look at, but just be aware that this, uh, how recent this field work is, it was uh, March 23rd through March 26th of last week. Um, we know that when we embarked upon this research, we wanted to see how relevant and resonating brands really are at this time. And respondents told us in no uncertain terms, focus on solutions for this crisis. Do not sell to me as you do generally. It's not relevant at this time. And the biggest takeaway that they came to came back to us saying is um, really protect your employees at all costs. This was very surprising to us uh, that they would expect uh, producers of consumer products or services to emphasize this. So I would take another moment uh, to commend the Dallas Regional Chamber on their your effort on this very point. Your program, Say Yes to Dallas, that connects displaced workers to jobs in other DFW organizations is a perfect example of solutioning. 
you see that people are really demanding products that help. They want products that are relevant to this time or don't really communicate about them to me at this time. They want to um, partner with government, as we mentioned earlier, uh, but they are really, really uh, demanding that this, uh, this kind of partnership even cross competitors. You know, what if uh, com uh, com competitors, two leading competitors in a sector uh, pulled together to create solutions. Um, again, kudos to the Dallas Chamber for their daily updates, as I mentioned before, and uh, as, a as a proof point of being an information source, I just want to thank our um, Richard Edelman for the fact that uh, for employees, he has brought personally every Monday, we get an hour with the former head and now senior advisor to the World Health Organization uh, for us personally, internally at Edelman to ask any questions we like and to get a personal briefing from the World Health Organization leader. And we also on Tuesdays make this same type of service with Dr. Navarro available to our clients. Um, we hear from the survey respondents that they want brands to use their power to educate. They want brands to be able to bring people together. And you have already started to see, I'm sure, the TV ads. They're attempting to do this, some to varying degrees of success than others. In our research and in working with clients from all sectors, a very important theme has emerged, is leading with empathy and with facts. So um, they want, um, people want to know how brands are helping. So we have examples that, I, that are, are really gratifying to see. JP Morgan Chase has pledged 50 million in a philanthropic investment to support the impacts of COVID. American Airlines is donating their you know, special repatriation flights to bring customers home. Dale has shared with us the story of the Toyota Way and the great work that they're doing, not only locally, but across the nation. So these are the kinds of stories that people are hungry to hear about brands. They, um, they want um, more communications around what brands are doing to provide comfort and reassurance, not just around solutioning, but how are you actually being, how can your brand comfort and reassure me and not just add to my anxiety and concern. So this is a new imperative for business and CEOs to show up with that empathy that I talked about earlier. Um, showing that you care. This is also really important and around the ability to express empathy and support, not only for your employees or your local communities, but how are you showing up as an empathetic brand? Um, we will have on Edelman.com some unique uh, points of view around empathy and the power of empathy and how empathy is a skill that can be developed. We're working with the group at Stanford to bring this to you. Um, we also hear that people want brands to focus on messaging around solutions. Don't just talk to me about your product in general as you would in normal times. And very important, people are really skeptical about brands who are already bringing humor or what they call escapism to COVID related issues at this time. Um, in terms of media, they are uh, really looking to brands to use all the traditional methods, but that earned media is the most readily believable for them. And I wanted to just move on quickly before Q&A to get to the impact on brands, and I can go through this really quickly. People are already telling us that they are turning to new brands and that they are um, uh, also very um, examining brands differently in this era. So one of the things that they also shared with us is that they say that brands that really don't um, have the right priorities, that are placing profit uh, priorities over profits more than people during this crisis, 
will lose my trust forever. So there is a lot at stake here. And in fact, one in three people have already said that they will punish brands that they do not respond well to. So I just wanted to end with a roadmap to trust for you folks, if I may, and then, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. In short, we know, we know from this research and in dealing every day with clients in charge of very large brands globally, that brands must be brave enough to join the fight. They, people want brands to help solve problems, to protect employees and their partners. They want uh, brands to get very creative on how to use their products and services to help. Uh, we know that they're asking for partnerships with government and collaboration across industries, even with your competitors. We need brands to act like fellow humans, they say. They want compassion as much as facts from brands. So in summary, this is a great time for brands to step into their human purpose and there's a risk if they don't. Otherwise, actions taken today will impact that trust equity that they have in the future. So the time is now for brands to do the right thing. I am going to go to Q&A and um, look at what we have coming up in our, um, our Q&A box. So let's see. So remember, it's the, it's the Q&A uh, icon that's in the bottom of the yeah, screen. I'm there. I don't see anything. No, I was telling people that the <laughs> Oh, OK. <laughs> OK. George, was, when you first saw this brand data as it came in yesterday, what was it that surprised you the most? I think what surprised me was seeing that, um, that, that people really have incredible expectations for brands. Um, we hear a lot on TV, we're watching politicians, we're, we're watching some healthcare uh, professionals, we see the media interview doctors and first responders on, on, on the news, but where brands have only been able to uh, speak on paid media. So for example, Einheiser-Busch came out with a beautiful campaign and they state in their message, we've taken our media dollars that we are, are not able to put into sports uh, advertising and put it towards the Red Cross for blood drives. Mm -hmm. So what I think is I would like to see companies and brands tell their story um, across channels. Yeah. And we're starting to see that, but I was surprised to see that people have such high expectations and desires for brands to step up. Right. Dale, do you want to share that Toyota story, which I found very powerful, what Toyota's doing? Yeah, Toyota, they're an amazing company. And let me give you an example of the kinds of things that they do just because of who they are. They came to Dallas about five years ago. And the first thing, they came from California and they moved to Plano, which is a, a suburb of Dallas, north of Dallas. And the first thing they did was they gave a million dollar check to the Plano School District. Then they gave six vehicles to the police department and fire department, big Tundra trucks or whatever, whatever that I think is, I apologize if I got the brand wrong, but their, their biggest truck, I apologize for that. The but, Tundra. Uh, okay, I hope so. <laughs> and then, but then they do other things. They, 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 um, they asked how they could help Parkland Hospital. Parkland Hospital is <laughs> our, our public, public hospital. hospital, right? It takes all comers. Yeah. And they said, how can we help them become more efficient? So they sent their efficiency team in, they call it the, to the Toyota way, and they, 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 they spent time with Parkland and they said, okay, who is, uh, the, that nurse should not be standing on that side of the bed. She should be standing on this side of the bed. <clears throat> Why are you touching that piece of paper three times? You only need to touch it once. Mm -hmm. And they made Parkland much more efficient. They then took their skills to the North, Tallis, uh, North uh, Texas Food Bank, which serves oh, wow. millions yeah. of meals throughout the year. And they put their Toyota way to work for making that more efficient. 
And then the Dallas County School, Dallas, our, Dallas ISD, our, our, our city school district, uh, had, a, had a, a busing challenge. And Toyota said, look, we, we can go. They've never run a busing um, um, uh, organization before. We can go in and make them efficient as to the bus routes and so on and so forth. And then when this came up, uh, they called and said, hey, we'd like to help with the testing here to make sure that m more people can get tested in a shorter amount of time uh, because of our efficiency experts. So they're an example of a company that is doing it right all the time, not just when the crisis occurs, but before the crisis, during the crisis, and I'm sure they'll be ha here after the crisis too. Dale, I, I shared with you in the past the whole idea of like making deposits into the trust bank. We talked about it the other day when we were preparing for this call. And we always encourage our clients, you know, if you're doing good and you're building that trust uh, with your stakeholders in good times, then when it's bad times or tough times, you can go make that withdrawal because your balance is high. Yeah, so absolutely. I think that's what Toyota has done. Uh, Sydney, there is a question, and I think we know the answer, which is, were there any specific brands that respondents call, called out in the survey? And I think we do, we do not see that in the data. Is that correct? No, we didn't ask for specific examples in the research, but the companies that I shared as examples supporting the insights and the data, there, is, um, there are a couple of really good, there's a, um, there's a website you can go to, it's a, a nonprofit called Just Capital AL, and they are keeping a track of a tracker, very thorough on what companies are doing to really support all of those points that came out in the trust. How are they partnering? How are they solutioning? How are brands showing up? And how CEOs are leading with empathy. So that's a really good resource to see because a lot of our clients, the first thing they want to know when they call us for crisis counseling is what are other companies doing? And um, uh, that's one very easily, you know, publicly available data. For can, you repeat, can, you re can you repeat that again? Someone just yes, asked for you. It's, it's just capital, J-U-S-T-C-A-P-I-T-A-L. I think it's dot org or dot, I think it's dot org. And they have a tracker. Um, I can send the link to Dale and we can make it available to everybody on this call, but it's just public. It's free to everyone. They're a nonprofit and keeping a, a very good track of that. I do see and, another question here around um, how should companies identify ways they can they can show that they empathize. So if you cross uh, reference some of the insights in the data and you think about this imperative that when we ask people about brands, we did not expect them to come back and say prioritize your people. So if you think about that fact and you also think about um, showing empathy and showing up in the community, it's, um, uh, you know, a great example is what the Dallas Chamber is doing is that they're trying to help their members uh, really treat the employees impacted by the exigencies of this business, you know, people who are being displaced and connect them to other companies in the area. That's a perfect example. But I think that overall, one of the things I've done a lot of reading on empathy in the past few weeks, I can tell you, and I've co-authored a piece with this um, leading expert on empathy from Stanford, and that will be available on edelman.com. But in all of the research that I've been doing, the discussions I've had with academics, is that empathy is a mindset first, right? And for the CEO to become the chief empathy officer, um, it's really the mindset first, and there are a series of exercises that you can go through to help cultivate this. Um, it's the name of this author is Jamil Zaki, Z-A-K-I, he's from Stanford, and if you go to, if you Google him and you ask for empathy exercises, you can, that's a head start on how to help create that mindset. Sydney, there's two, there's two people have asked very similar questions, which is, what counsel do we have for, for clients uh, so that they avoid looking like they're exploiting yes. the situation, how they can be authentic? Yes, and that is a great question. And I am, um, I'm, you know, maybe I'm biased because I do spend a lot of my time helping large organizations define and activate their organizational purpose. But 
I, you know, research has also told us that if you have carefully defined your organizational purpose, you can use that as a filter or a guideline in how you make decisions and how you execute. Um, so for example, if you're looking at how you want your brand to show up in the marketplace at this time, yes, you can see what other companies are doing. That's an easy benchmark. But I would ask companies to go back and look at their purpose. Filter your decisions and how you execute your decisions through the filter of purpose. So, you know, if you are a, one of our clients is um, a fintech company. So they're in finance and they are a technology company. And their purpose is to democratize finances for everyone. And so they are really digging deep to look at how they're applying that principle to questions about employee impacts, how they're going to support some of their partners and their vendors that are not like this, this particular client is not going to be that severely impacted, but they're looking at some of their partners and their vendors. How we build, you know, equity, trust equity, put that trust and equity in the bank with our partners and the vendors now um, so that they can, we can all thrive together. So look at your expression of purpose and use that as a guide. Sydney, there's, there's two pieces on edelman.com. Uh, Richard's commentary when we did the first coronavirus research, he put a statement together and he actually put some counsel there for clients and you know, people who are interested in reading about it. And then in this new one that we issued today, there's also some good guidance there on how brands can act in a way that's authentic, that's meaningful, and that doesn't come across as you're trying to exploit the situation. So I encourage the folks that are asking those questions because we got several of those. So go ahead and take a look at that. And then if not, uh, you can email Sydney or I with additional questions. And I see that my um, wonderful team member, Nisha, in the chat box has posted the link to the Trust Capital chat. Yes, I just forwarded that to all the panelists, to all the, oh, to all the attendees. Wonderful. Okay, Great. super. I know we're, we're approaching the end of time. Dale, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to ask one question, George, and, and of you, Sydney. Um, for organizations that did not have a clearly defined purpose before, or were doing okay, uh, in, in okay times uh, and feel like, oh my gosh, why didn't we do that before? You know, we need to get busy on this so that not only for now, but when the future crisis comes, we are a much more defined uh, company that has a real strong brand with the public. What can they do now to kind of get up to speed quickly? Yeah. So it's really a wonderful question. And some people believe that, oh, well, when, when we're doing well and in times of economic uh, largesse, it's, you know, thinking about things like purpose is a luxury. But actually, if you look, if you, if you go back and read the letter that Lawrence Fink wrote in a year and a half ago about why he wanted to refocus the org his organization to deal with clients who were purpose led, the way he defines purpose is really important. It's not fluffy. It's about what is your long-term strategy? What makes you different? Why do you do what you do that's different from everybody else? And that letter is, the, um, is really like a guideline and a guidepost for what purpose can be. Purpose is not just a, 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 you know, an exaggerated version of values. So I would say everybody go back and read that letter and then call us. We'd like to help you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sydney. Give us that name again. Give us that name. Yeah. Yes, Lawrence Fink, L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E Fink. Um, and he is the chair of BlackRock. And uh, go back and read that letter. He published the letter in, there was a big article in the New York Times in July uh, 2019. Uh, and then if you go and read his, not just a New York Times article, but read the letter that he wrote, it's a, a beautiful uh, strategic approach to how you uh, look at stakeholders and how you make critical ethical and competency decisions. Thank you. Hey, Sydney, what's the name of that Stanford researcher again? Can you spell the name? It's Jamil, J-A-M-I-L. 
uh -huh. Zaki, Z-A-K-I, and um, he and I are collaborating, so watch edelman.com for that. He wrote a book called The War for Kindness, Building Empathy in a Fractured World, which couldn't be more appropriate than now, even though he uh, wrote it a year ago, uh, six months ago. Hey, Sydney, I, I'm not sure if, um, Michael, you can tell us the questions that we didn't get answered. Some of them are probably quick responses that Sydney and I can respond in the chat box. Will the participants be able to stay on and get those responses or will we lose it when we leave the meeting? It's hard to ask a technical question, Michael. You'll lose them, but I can, I can send you the questions directly following. Okay, thank you. We'll try to get thank you, responses everyone. To people. And thank you, Dale, for hosting us. Really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, George. Thank you, Sydney. I, fascinating and uh, so useful right now. Uh, and I'm going to go back and read every word. Uh, <laughs> and I can't, I can't wait to dig into this stuff. Thank, Thank you, you very Dale. much. Thanks, everybody. This will be recorded and available through the chamber uh, in, a, in a day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, George. Thanks, Sydney. Thank you. Thanks to our audience. Thank you.